Hello and welcome to Orchard Online. My hope for you is that this can be a time for you to engage with the scripture, engage with the spirit of God, and that you will feel as though you're part of the body of Christ here at Orchard Christian Fellowship. I hope that that's true. One way that you can connect better with us is to send along a prayer request if you have something. Just tell us what's going on in your life. Send it to info at orchardnh.org and we'll do our best to lift your prayer request before the Father to engage with you. And so I encourage you to do that. Let's listen now and I invite you to participate as we sing our praise to our Heavenly Father. Let's worship him together now. the day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away Fears are washed away, washed away. All our fears are washed away. Sing that again. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here. 
welcome you here, Lord Jesus. I cast my mind to Calvary. Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still. name. 
this series of teachings we have called The Long Story Short. And briefly, let's go back and remember what we've learned in The Long Story Short. The story begins in understanding that the scripture are 66 books of a library. Inspired by God, filled with the Holy Spirit, the scripture is God's telling us about himself and how he has invited us into a relationship with him. The story begins with God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then God called out a people unto himself. He called those people to come to a land. And in that land, he gave them laws and ways of living, a reflection of his character, his justice, and his mercy. He led those people by kings. We looked at the life of David. He corrected those people by prophets. We learned about the weeping prophet, Jeremiah. And then the story hit its high point in the person of Jesus, the living word, the word made flesh, God dwelling among us in the person of Jesus. Jesus showing us the Father, a Father full of grace and truth. And through Jesus, the Father called the people to himself. We call it the church. The church is God's way of communicating his life and his love to the people of this world. The church is intermingled with and wrapped up and part of the kingdom of God, which Jesus has established here on earth. We are a people whose story never ends, but is filled with hope and joy for eternity. A people who are called to live out the ending of history in our daily lives right here, right now. We're going to take a look as we finish up this series of long story short, the return of Jesus and what it means for us as we follow him here in the 21st century. Would you pray with me, please? Let's pray together. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. As a follower of Jesus, we live out the future of the story before it happens. I'll say that again. As a follower of Jesus, we live out the future of the story before it happens. We are a people living in the promise of the return of Jesus. And the return of Jesus has influence upon us how we live right here today. Among the community of churches, the orchard holds to this essential truth. We've agreed as a community of churches, these are gonna be the, uh, the non-negotiables. Listen to this one about the return of Jesus. Jesus Christ will come again to the earth, personally, visibly, and bodily, to judge the living and the dead, and to consummate history and the eternal plan of God. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That is masterfully written. It is a clear statement of belief. Jesus is going to come back to this earth. He's going to come personally, visibly, and bodily. And he comes with a purpose to consummate history and the eternal plan of God, to judge the living and the dead. It is a clear statement of belief with very little details. And that's what we want. We want to have some details. We want to get this all figured out if we can. But the community of churches that the orchard is a part of, and in my own read of scripture, tells me this, that we get lost in the details. And we forget to focus upon this truth. There is a day coming when Jesus will return. We've been taught to pray for it, to call out for it, to long for it. But we can get so easily lost in the details. There's a great deal of information in the scripture about the return of Jesus. In particular, a church planted by the Apostle Paul in the area of modern-day Greece, uh, the church at Thessalonica. 
there was a great deal of unrest and questions about the return of Jesus. Evidently, Paul, after he had planted the church, somebody else began speaking about it and questions began to rise because they're still trying to figure out what Jesus meant when he said, I'm going to come back someday. And so the church in Thessalonia, they were struggling with that. And Paul, as he's interacting with the church there, he's sending his answers, their questions back and forth through his fellow servant named Timothy. Timothy takes the questions back and forth. He facilitates the, the conversation that Paul is having with the church there. And Paul speaks of the reality of Jesus' return. And as we say in our community of churches in the Evangelical Presbyterian Church of which the orchard is a part, we speak of the consummation of history. For that early first century church and for the 21st century church, there's lots of questions. Here's one of them. Has the return of Jesus already happened? And if it did, why are followers of Jesus still here? And what about those people who have passed away between the time of Jesus' first appearance upon the earth and his second coming to the earth? What about loved ones in our lives who have passed away? Great questions. Paul begins to answer. And he addresses the church there. And he speaks to you and to me with these words. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. See, Paul speaks of a hope that we have as followers of Jesus, even for those who have passed away. He says they're asleep, but they'll be awakened. And the hope for the awakening of those who have passed is established in the reality of Jesus' resurrection. Remember, Jesus crucified on Friday, put in a borrowed tomb. Come Sunday morning, the tomb was empty because Jesus had been resurrected to life. And Paul says he's the first fruit. He's the first one. He's the prototype of what we can expect as well. The resurrection will come for all of us who have placed our trust in Jesus. Christian scholar and author N.T. Wright pens these words. We are those who look forward to the resurrection of the dead with a new kind of hope. Because we belong to the Messiah who has already been raised, we are therefore those who anticipate the glory of genuine humanity restored in the Messiah and glimpsed by faith already within the Messiah's people today. Will that return of Jesus? be a secret event. There's a phrase used in the scripture, the coming of the Lord. It's a phrase, comes out of a single word, parousia. Of the seven times used by Paul, six of them are in First and Second Thessalonians. But parousia is always used as a singular event, describing a singular event. Here, how Paul describes it. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. A word that has been used greatly in recent years in churches like the Orchard is the word rapture. It's a word which originates from the Latin translation for the phrase caught up together. It certainly had a great appeal to me when I first began to hear about the story of Jesus. Having been raised Roman Catholic, there wasn't much talk of the return of Jesus and certainly not any talk of the rapture. So as, as a young man, I was greatly intrigued by this idea of the rapture is a pervasive teaching among followers of Jesus today. It's described as an event where the people of God are, are snatched away secretly by Jesus before his second coming. 
And as a teaching, understand this, please. As a teaching from the writings of a man by the name of John Nelson Darby, his teachings were popularized in North America. Darby was in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And his teachings were popularized in North America, largely through the Schofield Bible. That's an old Bible written many, many years ago. But more recent books, like the late great planet Earth, have described this rapture, this, this mysterious coming of Jesus and, and taking people away. And it is hard to nail it down to the specifics. Some teach that the rapture happens before the tribulation, some in the middle, some at the end. All of these details that the scripture speaks about, but it's hard to really come to a solid conclusion about. I do know this, though, that the scripture speaks of the coming of Jesus as a singular event. There is only one coming of the Lord. And when he comes, it will be unmistakable and undeniable. I think of it more of a reunion rather than the word rapture. The phrase coming of the Lord described what took place in the ancient world. Here's how it played out. A king would go off to battle. He would go with his forces. And if he were victorious, he would come sometimes with the enemies captured, but he would come back to his city and the people would stand on the walls. In fact, a watchman would be appointed. Look for the king, watch for the king. And, and when the, the person of the king was seen on the horizon, a trumpet would be blown because the king was returning and the people would run out of the city, congratulate their king, and they would come with the king back to their city. They wouldn't leave with the king and go somewhere else. They came back with their victorious king to their city. So what difference does it make, a rapture or a reunion? The teaching around the rapture, as it's been proposed by Darby and others, has provided a means for really well-intentioned people, I'm not throwing shade on anybody here, really well-intentioned people to just think of escaping the world. Just keep your head down, hide away, and do your best because the, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. But the idea of reunion, of being prepared for the coming of the Lord has a very different feel to it. We are a people filled with hope, preparing to meet our King, to be a church going and proclaiming to the world around us, our King is victorious and our King is coming someday. He is coming in victory someday. And we are welcoming him to a recreated, restored world where death no longer reigns, where death has been vanquished, where the lion lies down with the lamb, where Eden knows no boundaries, where God walks with his people. Well, there is no need for a temple made by human hands because God is with us everywhere. That thought of reunion speaks to what I believe that Scripture teaches us about the coming of the Lord in that phrase. And I'd invite you to consider how you would join Jesus in becoming prepared to receive him as a victorious king, to be a person filled with hope and anticipation, even if some of the questions are left behind. Will this return of Jesus be a surprise event without any warning? Well, for the person who is not following Jesus, it certainly will be. Here's how Paul described it. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying, 
there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. You see, for the person not following Jesus, fully unaware, fully unprepared, Jesus' return will be like a thief in the night. In other words, if we knew the thief was about to show up, we'd be ready, we'd be prepared. But for those of us who follow Jesus, who have said yes to Jesus, who are anticipating his return, Paul writes these words. He says, but you are not in darkness, brothers and sisters, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Notice how Paul changes from addressing people who are fully unaware to brothers and sisters who are fully awake and aware. Paul goes on to say to those of us who are followers of Jesus, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Now, from Paul's words there in describing us as followers of Jesus, he speaks of a breastplate of faith and love, a helmet of hope for salvation. He describes us as soldiers. Soldiers are men and women who are watching. They're looking. They're looking not just to fight against the enemy, they're looking for their commander. They're looking for their king. They're looking for the victory that Jesus has accomplished. And so we are to be that sort of person, taking the breastplate of faith, of faith in Jesus, of love, and the hope of salvation protects and guards us. When Jesus returns, as the scripture says, he will. What will he bring with him? He will bring those who have fallen asleep, those who have passed away, believing in Jesus. And they will come with him. That's the entourage, not enemies, but his people brought with him. And we who are alive at the return of Jesus, we will go out to meet him. Paul describes it as having been changed in an instant into the imperishable. In the twinkling of an eye, he says, how quickly it will happen. And people fully able to walk with God, not destined for wrath, but destined for salvation, living with Jesus. And this reunion described by scripture is one that the scripture says to us, as you've, as you've looked at the whole story of Jesus, the long story short, let this be your motivator. Let this be your inspiration. Let this be your reason. There is a day coming, the scripture says, when Jesus will come with those who have fallen asleep in him, those who have passed away, and they will come with him and we will be changed forever to dwell upon a recreated earth that Jesus will make new and restore. So, the long story short, here's one way to summarize our series. Out of these 66 books, there is one verse that has arisen out of all of those words. This one verse seems to find its way to the top, not just in terms of people's knowledge, but it captures the long story short. John chapter three, verse 16. For God so loved the world, the world he created, that he sent his one and only son, 
to a people called by God, to a people promised by God, to a people raised up by God, that whoever, including people of every tribe and nation, believes in him, are called into the family of God, believes that Jesus has died for us, that he was buried, that he was raised to life, and that he is going to come again someday. And whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, now and forever. Amen? Amen. The night before he was crucified, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples. And he entered into that evening knowing that he was going to the cross. And he put into that evening a view towards the long, long story of God. He says, there's gonna come a day when I will share this meal. And it will be when the kingdom has fully come. Oh. What a day that will be. The scripture calls it the marriage supper of the Lamb. A gathered together, the bride of Christ coming with Jesus. And so we take a little bit of bread. 
we take a sip of juice and we're reminded that there is a day coming when the Lord Jesus will come upon the clouds, the trumpet will sound, those who are dead in Christ will, will come with him and those who are still alive will be captured up together with him. And part of that celebration is gonna be a meal. Oh, what a meal it's gonna be. And so we eat a bit of bread, we drink a sip of juice in anticipation of the day when we will share that meal with Jesus. So, take a bit of bread, the body of Christ given for you. Take a sip and be reminded that our Lord has established a new covenant and you and I are part of it. And the day <laughs> is coming when this will be multiplied oh, a thousand times over. What a meal that will be. We look forward to it with joy and anticipation. God bless you. Amen.